Oops. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to thank you for coming to the Bay Area Prototype Modelers Meet this afternoon. And uh, we're going to have a clinic here that will feature mainly um, Southern Pacific's uh, beat gondola operation. I've focused <coughs> the historical information in this clinic based off of the transition era in the 1950s, but we're also going to look at a uh, place um, called Guadalupe on the coast division of the Southern Pacific, and we're going to look at the uh, operation there in depth, take a look at some of the uh, plant property and equipment that's used in um, the sugar beet industry. So uh, to welcome you today, uh, we will start with this slide of Guadalupe in the 1970s. Uh, this really shows uh, what SP used to be like with the uh, um, flimsies there and, and the <coughs> cars and pretty much everything at the track that you see in this photograph today is going to be So the official title of this is Modeling Transition Era Beat Trains in the Guadalupe Interchange. Oops. My name is Scott Inman. Uh, I originally prepared this for the Southern Pacific Historical and Technical Society Convention last year. I updated it for the NMRA uh, Sierra Divisions meet in January, and I've updated it again for this presentation. So this is the third version, and I hope you enjoy. We're going to talk about the evolution of beat gondolas, back to the beginnings. Uh, again, we'll talk about the Guadalupe Interchange and the role of the Santa Maria Valley, um, which interchanged with the SP there. We'll look at Betteravia and uh, the Union Sugar Plant. Um, and then we're going to get into the modeling aspect, which all of you are probably most interested in today, which is uh, we're going to use the Red Caboose G5023 um, gondola, general service gondola for our um, prototype model. And we'll talk about how I personally make beat loads, and I'll share my tips and uh, techniques with you for not only the loads, but the weather. So let's take a look at early uh, prototype beat gondolas. Um, Ventura County Railway uh, started very early on with this concept of using gondolas uh, for beats with the side doors there, and they had a fleet of 100 of these cars that were in captive service <coughs> on the Ventura County Railway. Um, and they would basically use these and uh, then take them to another transloader for um, shipment over the SP. And uh, uh, I don't think these cars lasted um, to ever uh, see um, service with the G50 series gondolas, I think there was a little bit of time there when these had been retired because they're pretty rudimentary, but that was the earliest iteration. And then Southern Pacific, they had an idea that they were going to take these uh, Harriman uh, flat cars like you see in this photograph, and uh, this guy by the name of Blackburn, he came up with a patent for these beat racks, which basically kind of mimic the Ventura County idea with the big side doors, and basically those things would open up, and there was kind of a uh, uh, there was a, a V-shaped uh, floor in this car, an A-frame, if you will, and the beats would just kind of billow out the bottom of this thing. So in the 1940s, um, you had this transition, and for a little while, you could see both the general service uh, wood gondolas with your Blackburn patented beat racks, and here we see that as evidence. Now, one of the fascinating things about modeling the Blackburn beat rack is that you have to kind of pick your poison. You can see there that all three of the Blackburn beat racks in this photograph are different. They have a different number of extensions on the top, and you can go on and on. There's the different types of flat cars they used. So, uh, virtually this period of transition for beat gondolas on the Southern Pacific is um, uh, relatively um, fruitful in the number and various types of cars that you could model, in, especially in HO. So here um, we really see the old Harriman cars go away. Those that were left uh, were used in maintenance away service, and as Southern Pacific acquired vast numbers of these 50-ton uh, gondolas, um, they were used extensively over the system for 
beats. And originally, uh, this was the configuration. You had the <coughs> low side or the original uh, side gondolas, um, just like this. And uh, most of you probably know that this is going over Coesta. This is a uh, Choro siding, which is coming in. And um, this is just one of my favorite Southern Pacific Company photographs of all time because not only does it show you this beautiful train, but that is the perfect um, photograph for the color and weathering of beets, uh, the natural dirt, so to speak, on beets. So let's talk about extensions. So in 1957, March to be exact, um, Southern Pacific came up with this idea that uh, they could expand the capacity of these cars um, by raising the boards on the side uh, so that you could, of course, fit more beats. And this was perfectly appropriate because uh, the capacity, the nominal capacity of the cars hadn't been exceeded yet. So they took them into uh, some shops, Fresno being one of them, as this car is um, what it, and they put this three board extension on these gondolas. And um, this was pretty much exclusively for an experiment to use with beats. And it turned out so successful that they did this. Um, I don't have a really robust uh, photograph of this in the prototype form, but my friend Andrew Merriam took a uh, Detail Associates gondola and modeled this. You can see there where it has the three board original extension, and then they would literally clamp on two more boards on top of that. <laughs> and this is something that is really cool to model if you're a diehard beat guy. And then, of course, um, and actually, if you look to the far left of this photograph, you'll see there's a prototype of that. And then the car in the middle, which this photograph uh, represents, is the five board extension that Southern Pacific uh, went to immediately after the three board was adopted and then expanded. And then, of course, you have this high side plywood extension, which was kind of like the cheaper version of the five board. I, I think uh, kind of what happened was after they realized that they could go with the five board, and this was kind of the adopted height um, for you know, ease of conversion, plywood was the ticket. And certainly there was a ton of these. Both the board and the plywood extensions lasted until, um, well, I remember seeing the last of them on the uh, Valley Line, probably about 1993, like photographs. And after that, that was about the end of it. And there's inside and outside post versions. Yeah, oh, in fact, yes, Tony mentioned something that's really neat here. You can see the photograph is the outside post, and then the SP advertisement, of course, is the inside. They did board versions like that, too. Yes, they did. So, again, um, very fruitful choices here. So now that we have a kind of an idea of what Southern Pacific used for its beat gondolas in that uh, wide time period, let's talk a little bit about the operation. And for our historical society, we met last year in San Luis Obispo, which of course is on the Coast Division. And um, I decided, well, I'll pick Guadalupe as a perfect place to describe the history of the operation of sugar beets on the SP because you had literally you had sugar beets coming from all various places throughout the state converging on this location <coughs> and uh, what better of a place to pick than, than Guadalupe. And again here is the depot and a similar scene just turned a little bit to the west of what we looked at earlier. So this is an aerial view of Guadalupe. This is more recent. The depot, of course, is gone now. But the depot would have been up toward the top of this image, where it starts to curve over there. And this is SP's uh, Guadalupe Yard, which um, amazingly hasn't changed a whole lot over time. And of course, then down toward the bottom is the Santa, Mar uh, Santa Maria Valley interchange, where it came up to meet the SP and interchange um, all kinds of traffic, including beat gondolas that were going onto their railroad. So this is a similar view to the, the depot shot just a second ago, but th this is a very, very important shot because Guadalupe, in many cases, was a unique example of beat uh, 
traffic and movement on the Southern Pacific because in Guadalupe you had the entire spectrum of beet production in one location. <coughs> and if you look just to the left of the depot behind that uh, SP company truck there, you will see a beet loader. And so uh, the fascinating thing about Guadalupe is they grew beets there, they loaded beets there, and they processed beets there. And it was a very fascinating operation until its closure. Here again, um, this is another view, a little different time period, but it doesn't show up too well um, because we've got so much light coming through. But over there, just behind the depot, are beat gondolas that are being serviced by that loader. So let's talk a little bit of nostalgia, and I'll give you a brief rundown of beat traffic in the 1950s as it, it, uh, uh, in regards to the planet at Betaravia. So we have this seasonal pattern of movement on the Southern Pacific, and beats started um, in really in uh, the Imperial Valley during the harvest season. Between April and July, beets were moved north uh, to Union Sugar at Betaravia. And then in the late summer, they shifted the cars to the Bakersfield area, and they would run beets out of that uh, location. Um, and most of the time, those beets would come around Altamont, although you would see uh, various traffic patterns change if uh, certain portions of the uh, railroad was busier due to other events. Um, and then also, you had between the, the late summer, um, early fall to the end of the year, you had beats that actually came from the Coast Division. Um, Somas, which is um, uh, near Van Nuys, um, and you had Antelope Valley sugar beets came up the coast to Betaravia in the late fall. <coughs> This is a uh, perfect example of beet traffic coming out of the Imperial Valley during the spring season that I just described. This is uh, extra 4367 westbound at Frink. Frink is a siding on the um, Salton subdivision of the Los Angeles division. And uh, this train is pulling into the siding <laughs> to wait for the passing of the eastbound Sunset Limited. And this is uh, June 18, 1953. So here we have Guadalupe. This is what the yard looked like in this transition era. This is uh, November of 1952. And in November, the beet season had started to wind down a little bit. But you can still see there was a lot of traffic for the Santa Maria Valley and for the local industries at Guadalupe, which were serviced out uh, by a local that ran out of a San Luis Obispo yard. And ton of refrigerator traffic, a lot of industry that was serviced by the Santa Maria Valley, and there was a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and that's probably why most of these tracks survive today, is because Santa Maria Valley still uh, does a fairly good business, even though the beets are good. So here's beets in Guadalupe. This is August 1955. Uh, that's a deck that is pulling out. Um, and this, uh, these beets have just been set out for the Santa Maria Valley. They are, this is a loaded beet train. These beets would have come from Bakersfield and have arrived here. And so uh, this engine will run back to San Luis Obispo and the Santa Maria Valley will come down and interchange with these beets. And so we're gonna look at the Santa Maria Valley Railroad. Um, there, there are, um, Naming conventions were slightly different for Southern Pacific, and their, the name for their interchange was a place called Bar Sug, and so they would come off the SP there, and they would run literally straight down, as you can see, just on that tangent line to the end of the Betaravia branch, their Betaravia branch, and that was a pretty straight, flat, no-nonsense uh, run straight down to the plant there for all the sugar beets. The sugar beets did not have to go trundling across um, the other portions of the railroad. <coughs> so, uh, Union, or Holly Sugar, which it came to be in later uh, years when Holly kind of uh, um, took over a lot of smaller uh, 
uh, sugar outfits, uh, was in operation for almost 100 years, from 1897 to 1994. Uh, today, <coughs> most of this is gone. It's totally out of service, and a lot of this has been scrapped out. But um, this is back in the uh, uh, 1970s when this was, of course, still going strong. And you have your beet processing plant and uh, pulping facility and everything right there in that building, that four-story building there. Um, and the process of beet refinement uh, is very fascinating. And there's been videos done by Pentrex and a lot of other people that cover that in depth. And they're really uh, wonderful if you can get a hold of a copy of that. So um, this is what it looked like on the Santa Maria Valley. This is in the 70s, but the idea is the same. Santa Maria Valley for a long time loved to use... Um, small economical motive power. They even had um, this, uh, somebody remind me of the, the model that they had, but they had this export engine that never actually left the country, and instead Santa Maria Valley bought it, and it had the very, very small cab. The crews hated to use the thing, and so it was always <laughs> paired up with another 70 tonner. But this is what beat trains would look like. They would take the SP cuts of beats and bring them to, to Better Avia uh, in, uh, by half of a train at a time. So this is back to um, August of 1952. These are all low side um, beat gondolas up on the transfer dock at Better Avia plant. And what happens here is the um, doors, the drop bottom doors of the gondolas would open up and the beats would be dumped out and they had these wash racks that would slide across <coughs> this platform and they would literally wash the beats down into the trenches and then water running through the trench toward the plant would literally carry the beats into the processor. So now let's talk about modeling, which is what we really want to get to. And during this, um, I'll throw in some more prototype historical information, and definitely don't let me forget to talk about the perishable aspect of beets uh, during this. <coughs> but um, I have chosen to start with the red caboose, a uh, G5023 prototype that they have made so many of. And I chose this because I have built uh, successfully in my life one of the detail associates. <laughs> yeah, so you're all familiar with the trial and tribulation that you go through uh, during the period of gestation uh, while you're building that car. And so uh, I brought the example that I built. It's sitting out on the um, display tables across from the SP Models booth. <coughs> And you can take a look at that. Um, uh, I love the way it came out. But I have some big criticisms of that kit besides the way it goes together. Um, my biggest one would be that they did not allow a place really for a proper weight. Um, that's not as critical as it once was because we in the model railroading community have better standards for track and sub road bed than that today. But um, uh, I know that uh, Terry Wegman at one time had made white metal doors for those cars, but still it was very tough to get weight into them. So <coughs> I have decided to pretty much standardize on the beautiful kit that Red Caboose made, and I have made a lot of upgrades to the detail on these so that you can bring them up to a similar level as the uh, detail associates cars, even though they don't have, you know, see-through doors and stuff like that, which in my opinion, if you're going to model a loaded car, that's unnecessary regardless. So what I do here is I go through and I replace a lot of the train line, the main reservoir lines, and, and a lot of the piping with, with brass. Um, I like to use, uh, I think it's 12,000s for stuff like this. And then, um, as you can see, I, I've replaced all of the... Uh, the air hoses and, and the coupler cut lever bars and things like that. And also one thing I like to do is um, I don't do this on the ladders, but certainly the individual grab irons I like to use brass. 
and the stirrup steps. I like the ones from A-Line. They work great for these cars. And I reinforce those with a piece of styrene, as you can see behind there. And all of these modifications are visible on the car um, out front, including what I do to basically super glue the red caboose trucks together, because their bolster design, in my opinion, um, so, was sore. So. Yeah, it, it, it sucks. Thank you, Tony. You took the words right out of mouth. <laughs> but due to the um, sort of inability of, uh, or inavailability of T-section trucks by some other manufacturers at the time these cars came out, I just decided, okay, I'm going to glue the trucks together, and I have a great... Um, two-part pieces of glass that I put together with weights and all this. And I don't know if you need to go through that extreme, but I do it. I like the results. And we can look at the end of the car. Um, I like to do upgrades with uh, things like the stainless um, platform for the brake wheel. And you can see here uh, my techniques and kind of tricks that I use for the coupler cut lever. I like to put a piece of styrene over the draft gear cover to kind of hold that um, cut lever in place and it works for me and again I'm using the high-tech details um, uh, air hoses because they're rubber uh, in construction and they are so forgiving that it's just fantastic I would urge you if you have not ever used the detail or the uh, high-tech details air hoses to experiment with them it's, it's been a wonderful thing in my modeling Okay, so this is the part you're all probably very curious about. How do I personally make beat loads? And I'm going to tell you that this is the difference between being a Pentecostal and a fundamental Baptist because everybody will give you a different version of how they make beat loads. Um, my version is uh, I'm probably one of the craziest uh, when it comes to this because I use so many different things in my mix. But um, I went down to the local Mediterranean market, and I found that for about $2.25, you can buy an entire bag of something called anise seed. And that's enough seed to do probably 50 loads. And one day I was walking through Rayleigh's, which is about two blocks from my house in Elk Grove, and I saw that for the same bottle of anise seed, they wanted about $8. And I said, <laughs> to heck with this. So go down to your local Mediterranean or... Asian food store and you can buy these in bulk. So for this entire thing right here, which will, like I say, I'll do, uh, if you're conservative, you can probably get 50 loads out of these, but if you like a lot of seed over your load, uh, maybe 25. But all this costs maybe seven or eight dollars. The other key ingredient is the fenugreek on the left. It's a larger seed, it has great color. It's a little out of scale but I like the, the random size of it, and so I will describe to you in a minute how all these ingredients go together. But one thing I want to describe is, note the bean soup mix. You're thinking, what in the world are we doing here? I take that bean soup mix and I put it through a coffee grinder. Why do I do this? Okay, this is what took me a couple of years to get right. And I experimented with all kinds of things. I won't tell you how much money I wasted, but it's ridiculous. And so I put this bean soup mix, you just buy the cheapest you can find, put it through a coffee grinder, and this is what you get in that bag. You see the color. Well, the color on the left is after you spray it with glue and let it dry. And that is a perfect color. It gives you the texturing that you want. There's little flakes of stuff in there that looks like you know, leaves or dirt or whatever that's left over in the harvesting process. And I think this is fantastic to mix in with your seed. So let's talk about actually making the loads. This is the easy part. You measure your car, and all you have to do really is use a pair of calipers or whatever you'd like. And the reason I take the, and use the calipers is because I use this two-inch foam that I had to drive to Nevada to get because Home Depot refuses to carry it in the land of fruits and nuts. Oh, I'm sorry, California. And so um, what we have here is uh, this two-inch foam, which... I'll describe in a minute how I use it. So I take those calipers and I literally run right down the side of it and I score it. And this is great. And so I thought, well, gosh, you know, how am I going to cut this stuff? 
And I remember when I was a kid, my grandparents used to use this electric knife for carving a piece of roast. And I thought, well, that thing is sitting gathering dust now. So I confiscated it from the kitchen, and now it's a great part of my modeling tools because I, I use that sucker, and it just cuts through this foam like a hot knife through butter, and it's the you know, next best thing since sliced bread. And, okay, so what happens here? Well, the foam is too big, but you guess what? I realized you get two loads for the price of one. So you take this, and you just cut it in half, and there's what you get. You have two loads, and this, now we're really starting to go someplace with this. So, again, um, I think this was my great-grandfather's, and so since it's a, an item of uh, historical interest to the family, I just use it for foam. It hasn't seen wood service in a long time. But it's perfect. I go out in the backyard, and I put this rasp over a gar garbage can, because you're going to get a bunch of purple shavings everywhere. Um, and instead of looking like Barney when you're done with this, you just put them all into the trash can. And so this is what your load looks like after you get it shaped. And again, this is all done with the rasp, and you can do this in about five minutes. So how do we paint it? Um, I've done a bunch of these loads for friends before, and I take a huge piece of cardboard, line the thing with duct tape, and I paint a bunch of them with the cheapest brown Rust-Oleum paint you can find at Orchard Supply or Home Depot. But for this clinic, I just used a shoe box and a little piece of tape, and you can see there, uh, again, making one of these loads is, from start to finish, is about a 20-minute thing, and if you group them together in an afternoon, you can do 50 of them. So after painting, this is what you get. It looks like a Snickers bar. And it really looks like a Snickers bar here. <laughs> More like a baby Ruth. Yeah, baby Ruth, thank you. So, you know, uh, we always have food in mind when we're modeling, or at least I do. And um, so basically, this is how I start this. You get the paint on there, you let it dry. 3M products, God bless them, they make this spray adhesive. So I spray that stuff on there right out of the can. And you put that fenugreek seed on there. And this really gives you the texture that you want for your beet load, in my humble opinion. Okay, where does that bean soup mix come in? All right, this fills in your voids and your gaps. You, your glue is still perfectly usable from the spray can, and this is all done in about a two-minute process. You put the fenugreek seed on there, you sprinkle the thing with the uh, bean soup mix, and you're thinking, boy, this guy's crazy. What does he do next? So then you add the top coat of this anise seed. And you can see there where now you have a depth to this. That bean soup mix is filled in around the fenugreek. Your anise seed gives you the uh, accurately sized load for <coughs> HO. And some of them even have tails, which represent the root of a beet. And I think that the mix between the fenugreek on the bottom giving you the right color and and everything, plus the anise seed on top is wonderful. Now, how do you get a uniform color? Well, what I do is I take ground nutmeg, again, you get it for about 75 cents at your Mediterranean market, and you sprinkle the top with that ground nutmeg. And right after you do that, you can come back with a, a, a sealing coat of either matte medium or what I do is just the El Cheapo old-fashioned Elmer's glue and water with a drop of soap. And that's how I glue all this together. And you let it dry in the sun for a couple of hours and bada bing, bada boom. So my friend Derek Wagner, he said, you have a challenge. And I said, okay, what's going on? And he said, I want you to make your loads where it's accurate and the support rails for the high side beat gondolas actually run through the load. And I said, well, that's no problem. I'm doing these out of foam. So I literally just took a 3 16th inch drill bit and red caboose, um, that tap glue that they use in China or whatever, uh, just these uh, rails just literally come right off the car. You just clip them off with your hands. You run them through there. You put the load back in. And these are, are not even glued to the side of the car. Um, the load holds the rails in place, and it looks just like that. You guys can look at the car I have uh, out front, 
But the only dilemma and the only problem with doing it this way is if you remove the load to run an empty train, mm. you either have to live with the fact that your support brackets are gone, or you have to like make another set out of styrene and put them in every time. I am not that picky. In fact, when I get this train done, I'm not sure I'm ever going to take the loads out. So then the next step is weathering. Again, this is something that is very personal in this hobby. Weathering, to me, in the transition era, is subtle. And the only graffiti that I like are chalk marks from railroad employees. <laughs> and that's not graffiti. No, it's not graffiti. That's right. Yeah, thank you, Tony. It's, it's actual uh, useful reporting marks that the people have written for Waybill or whatever information. And so um, I, think, uh, I think I've done all this um, using this, these water-based paints that are available from Com Art. And the reason I like those water-based paints is because you put them into your airbrush, and they shoot on anything that's either has a dull finish or has been uh, sealed with a flat clear coat. And they, they go on there wonderfully. I've done the trucks with those. I've done all the weathering patterns on these. And again, if you're going to model 1959 or whatnot, when these uh, high sides were very prolific, you don't want an incredible amount of weathering. If you're going to do the later era, these cars need to basically look like they're just totally beat uh, to hell and that they've lost all their paint along the wood. And, and with, with very few exceptions, I don't think these cars were shopped for repainting much after about 1964 or 5. I think by that time they had all been converted and lived the rest of their service, even with um, solid bearing trucks, amazingly, because they were not for interchange. As we could get away with that for a long time. And basically my motto here is rinse and repeat. This is the low side version. Um, most of you guys know that I'm primarily a steam era modeler, so most of my fleet is this, but this is a car that's had all the detail upgrades and um, uh, the, the wheel sets and wheel faces are painted. And This is something that in our model railroad club and in the community I really advocate for is going the extra mile because a lot of modelers they will put an incredible amount of detail into their equipment <coughs> and then something so simple as painting the wheels gets lost in translation so I would encourage you all to take the, the next step and weather your wheels or paint them and uh, of course this is this is the result now um, I want to talk for a minute about the beats themselves, and we'll, we'll wrap this up by making a full circle and going back to some uh, historical data. Beats in nature, not a lot of people realize the perishability of a beet crop. Depending on the heat index, and remember most beets are harvested in the <coughs> late spring, summer, early fall when there's a lot of heat, especially in the Imperial Valley. Beets had a lifespan of about 48 to 60 hours before they would literally start turning the sugar inside of the beets and rotting themselves. So these were a very, very high priority movement on the railroad. And in the slide I had earlier of that beat train at, at uh, Fink, um, really the only time the beats would hold was for the passenger. So if you are going to model a beat train on your railroad accurately on the main line, it should have priority over all other trains except passenger, including your perishable refrigerator track. <coughs> I would like to thank uh, our Southern Pacific Historical and Technical Society archives, uh, the Chard Walker Collection at PRS, Mr. Charlie Lang, Pete Arnold, Stan Kistler, Dallas Gilbertson, Southern Pacific themselves, and the Western Railroader Collection for all of the photographs in this. And uh, this is the time for the shameless commerce plug. Um, those of you who are members of our society may know that this is the 150th anniversary this year of the Southern Pacific. If you are free on October 7th through 11th, please join us in Sacramento. You don't have to be a member to register for our conventions, although we would appreciate your support. 
But come to uh, the California State Railroad Museum on October 8th, that's Thursday, for the anniversary party. Uh, former President Mike Mohan of the Southern Pacific will be giving a speech at that event. Um, it's going to be an epic convention, so please consider attending. Details are on our booth out there or up on the website, sphts.org. Another thing I'll mention is I included this photograph uh, of an excursion on the Santa Maria Valley because um, I'm currently working on a book which will be published by the SP Society that features 60 years worth of Southern Pacific special passenger trains, all of the rail fan excursions and officer specials and special movements. So if you'd like to contribute photographs, it's not too late, although I have a full slate of images. But uh, once again, thank you very much for coming today and enjoy the rest of the VAPM experience. All right.